Tonight, paradise underwater. Death, devastation, desperation. The Bahamas ravaged by Hurricane Dorian. We're on the ground. A showdown over Brexit deals a blow to Boris Johnson. Enough. The country wants this done. Why it may lead to an election. Canada votes. Could Doug Ford block the Conservatives' return to power? Rosemary is in a key election battleground. And tension again on the streets of Hong Kong. Oh, no, We're right in the middle of it. See what's happening over here? This is the National. This is what Dorian left behind. We're getting our first look from above tonight at the destruction in parts of the Bahamas after being battered for days. This is Great Abaco Island, where it hit first. And tonight, the number of people killed by the hurricane has risen to seven. And there will be more, officials are warning. Stephen D'Souza is in the Bahamas, where there is now a frantic attempt to help those who've survived. The absolute destruction seen from above. Last week, Great Abaco Island was known as a sailor's paradise. Today, relief workers are using the word apocalyptic. This is a before and after. So much of the island suddenly submerged. Hurricane Dorian hit Abaco first on Sunday, the most powerful storm ever recorded in the Bahamas. The U.S. Coast Guard is using helicopters to get some of the injured out to Nassau. People are saying, I've lost everything. And the only thing, you know, you could say, you know, everything is going to be all right. You know, I mean, keep praying. On Grand Bahama Island, neighbors are rescuing each other on jet skis and in boats. These people are going out and pulling people from their houses, from on top of their houses, and saving their lives. Look, there's a little... A little baby here, they're a boy, they're, they're covering up and protecting. At this point, they estimate hundreds more were still out there. We Bahamians, we're not going to stop until we get everybody in. Dorian stalled over the island for hours, ripping it apart and sending people scrambling up as water rushed into their homes. The fear today, rescuers will be too late for some. Well, we have persons trapped in the roof and, and a lot of those individuals, we haven't been able to hear from them for the day and we cannot get to them. Over local radio, Bahamas National Emergency Management Agency urged people to hang on, telling them, we haven't forgotten you. The United Nations and Red Cross estimate more than 60,000 Bahamians will need food and clean water. A big complication to getting aid in, this is the airport in Grand Bahama, under two meters of water. You can see Grand Bahama Island here and Great Abaco, where Dorian first made landfall. Just to the south is Nassau, the capital of the Bahamas. And that is where Steve is tonight. Steve, the Prime Minister addressed his country late this evening. What did he have to say? Well, he said that he actually took a tour of uh, Great Abaco Island today, doing an assessment, and he just said it was completely, it was utterly decimated from the parts that he saw. You know, you see the pictures of that airport in Grand Bahama. One of the airports in Great Abaco Island he described as looking like a lake. Another one does have a clear runway, but the roads leading to it are flooded. So that gives you a sense of the difficulty they're going to have in terms of getting aid. There are many aid groups here in NASA mobilizing now, waiting for the green light. And while the government says they are hoping to give the all clear in terms of weather forecast tomorrow morning at 5 a.m., they say they still need to do more assessments before they can allow much needed aid. Although they do say a Navy vessel is coming in tonight to Great Abaco Island to deliver much needed food. And the prime minister made a call out to the other Caribbean islands as well as to Bahamians around the world saying we need some help because the recovery here is not going to be measured in days or months, but years, Andrew. Okay, Stephen D'Souza in Nassau tonight. Thanks so much. Dorian's path through the Bahamas helps explain why the destruction is so severe. When it first made landfall, consider it was moving at about 11 kilometers an hour. That's not very fast. You can run faster than that. And then for 28 hours, Dorian slowed down even more to about two kilometers an hour, sometimes not moving at all. It finally started picking up speed again this morning. But meteorologists say it got stuck because the high and low pressure systems that usually move storms along were in a tug of war, something they say is happening more often as the world warms. Dorian is now forecasted to head up the east coast over the next few days. Along that coast, people have been preparing for days now. There are evacuation orders in place from Florida to the Carolinas. But as David Common shows us, the threat has lessened some where it was once the greatest. 
Dorian's punch had been feared for a week with dire warnings across Florida. Yet its actual arrival with less destructive force than first predicted became something of a curiosity. Even with the storm center well off into the ocean, the enormous amount of storm surge from the winds and rain became apparent quite early in the day. Enough to submerge some boats, crash others into rocks as wind gusts tore up the coast. But after days of anxious preparations, mandatory evacuations and closures, the storm's shift meant the impact was not as feared. A little bit frustrating, but we're very fortunate that we got out of here uh, or made out without any uh, serious damage. I feel bad for the people in the Bahamas. Luckily, the heaviest rain will be right along the center and to the right. Georgia's coast is the next to feel Dorian, the Carolinas and Virginia before Friday. And so preparations in those states are now underway. Do not try to ride it out. You're putting your life at risk. And you're also putting at risk the lives of first responders who may have to rescue you. Authorities insist even with a storm offshore, one that's losing strength, danger still exists. Floridians, meanwhile, are just ready to see the end of it all. David Coleman, CBC News, Fort Pierce, Florida. Now watching from here in Canada, people with friends and family who are right in Dorian's path. As Jamie Strachan shows us, they're now trying to help from afar. You know, fingers are crossed. Firefighter Andre DeVoe is in Toronto, but his mind is with his father and the rest of his family in the Bahamas. It's a helpless feeling. Uh, and the Bahamas are in need right now, and you know, I want to be there. I want to be on the ground helping. He's doing what he can, volunteering with Canadian charity Global Medic, preparing emergency supplies. He's one of many Canadians pitching in. A few blocks away, Chris Ashton, who was born in the Bahamas, is raising money to buy supplies that he will drive down to Florida and then ship to the Bahamas. All we can do right now is, is you know, pray for them all and uh, get down there as soon as we can to, to lend whatever hand we can. That help is desperately needed. Canadian Tim Tibbetts, who owns a restaurant in the Bahamas, says the devastation is unfathomable. It's all gone. I mean, if you could imagine a tsunami and a, and a nuclear weapon going off in downtown Toronto. Tibbetts found safety on higher ground, but he doesn't know if his house is still standing. Three years ago, he lived through the devastation of Hurricane Matthew and knows recovery is long and hard. All of your photos, you know, your kids' things, Everything's soaked, everything is ruined, everything you own is gone. In the coming days, he will begin to assess the damage, starting with his house, and says it will be a long time until things return to normal, if they ever do. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, let's go to the UK now, where today Britain's new Prime Minister got a pretty brutal reality check. First, Boris Johnson lost his party's oh-so-slim majority in Parliament. One of his MPs crossed the floor. Then other members of his own party helped the opposition take control of the agenda. Margaret Evans looks at where that leads Britons and Brexit now. Spare a thought for the people of Britain. More than three years after that fateful Brexit referendum, they still don't know when, how, or even if they'll be leaving the European Union. I don't think anyone really knows the answer, even the MP. If you asked me yesterday, I would give a different answer than today. Currently, it looks like we're going a bit down the toilet. Today's showdown in the British Parliament was hardly encouraging. This was the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson's welcome after the end of the summer recess. This is a government with no mandate, no morals, and as of today, no majority. It was the Prime Minister's first appearance in the House since critics accused him of trying to force through a disorderly Brexit by suspending Parliament. That's what they want, to force us to beg to force us to beg for yet another pointless delay. Order. But tonight, a cross-party alliance succeeded in wresting control of tomorrow's parliamentary agenda from Johnson's government, so they can table legislation aimed at stopping a no-deal Brexit. The eyes to the right. 21 of Johnson's Conservative MPs rebelled against him, despite the cost, expulsion from the party. A sign of just how brutal the politics here 
has become. Be under no illusion, no matter how this particular logjam in the Brexit saga unfolds, this is the new normal, a divided nation for the foreseeable future. For an election. Johnson's response to the Commons' defeat was to immediately threaten an election. I don't want an election, but if MPs vote tomorrow to stop negotiations and to compel another pointless delay to Brexit, potentially for years, then that would be the only way to resolve this. But he'll still need a two-thirds majority in Parliament to approve it. Even if we were to get an election that were to allow Boris Johnson to take us out, the idea that that would be some kind of clean break is, of course, nonsense. Um, we would still be stuck in this Brexit loop for years and years and years. Spare a thought for the British people. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Now, here in Canada, we know an election call is on the way. And yes, it's still not official yet. But try telling that to all the major political parties who are already vying for key battlegrounds. And over the next seven weeks, the National will be covering those fights up close. Rosa, you're kicking off that coverage from Mississauga, Ontario tonight. Yeah, that's right. We're starting here in the Toronto area where Conservatives and Liberals have a lot to hope for and to worry about, frankly. We'll go into why a little bit later in the show. According to polls, one party that is not a factor here or in many parts of the country is the NDP. And so it's unveiling new ads and a new message. But as Ashley Burke explains, a group of NDPers sent a message of their own. The NDP still hasn't nominated a single candidate in New Brunswick and it won't be any of these people. I'll be joining the Green Party of Canada and New Brunswick, and I invite my NDP colleagues to do the same. 14 NDP provincial candidates and a senior member are abandoning the party and throwing their support behind the provincial and federal Greens. Unfortunately, in New Brunswick, the NDP does not have a path to victory. The NDP is trying to stop voters from abandoning it as well especially in Quebec, where it's most in danger of losing seats. Je ne suis pas comme les autres. This is the party's French ad released today. It tackles a big issue head-on. Under Quebec's new secularism law, Singh couldn't get a job as a teacher unless he removed his turban. The ad presenting Singh as someone who understands the struggles of being a minority. How he shares characteristics with Quebecers, uh, that for him also his uh, cultural identity is very important and he knows that it is to Quebecers as well and he wants to be an ally for Quebec. Paul suggests the NDP's problems go beyond Quebec. Now they're at about 13 percent. They're more or less in a fight for, with the Green Party for that fourth place spot. And if there's an election held today, there'd be a question whether they could reach the 12 seats needed for official party status. And hasn't nominated candidates in nearly half the ridings across the country. One of the reasons why it's taken us so long is we want to change the status quo. And the status quo is that women are not represented in politics. We don't see a lot of equity-seeking people in politics. The New Democrats are used to being underdogs. I have fought in election campaigns where uh, people had very similar takes at the beginning of the campaign and at the end we were forming government. But the party is facing a severe cash crunch. The campaign this time around will be more targeted with leaner staff and less time on a charter plane. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. With 48 days till ballots are cast, it's a race to get names on those ballots. And as of now, one party is already at the finish line. The Conservatives said today they have reached a full slate of 338 candidates. Almost there next is the People's Party of Canada, Maxime Bernier's party at 316. The Greens are next at 288. Behind them, the Liberals with 276. And as you heard at the back, the NDP so far with just 100. And 81 candidates. So we'll be spending time in key ridings across the country, of course, to help you make sense of what could decide this election. Tonight, we start right here. Ontario is open for business. Doug Ford won big here, but since the provincial election, his popularity has plummeted. Andrew Scheer takes his cues from the Ontario Premier. So which party will Ford help or hurt this fall? We go in-depth on the Ford factor later in the hour. Now back to Toronto. Yeah, we are keeping a close eye on Hong Kong tonight, where the Chinese government is signaling enough's enough. After days of school and general strikes, the nighttime remains in places volatile and sometimes violent. And China is losing patience. 
Beijing says it can unilaterally declare a state of emergency. That could give the military the green light to move in. So tonight, Adrian leads our special coverage once again. So, Andrew, as China continues its firm warnings, and you mentioned some of them there, the angry here don't seem scared away. In fact, they seem to be digging in. That is worrying for all. And don't forget, this is home to 300,000 Canadians. That's just one of the reasons why the National is in Hong Kong. It gives us a chance to dig into the nuance of what's really going on here. And sometimes the truth is hiding in plain sight. You just have to look a little harder to find it. The drive for Hong Kongers to keep doing this can be hard to comprehend from afar. But fear motivates, even if some of what they fear isn't always easy to see. I try to count, actually, to count the percentage of the... Investigative journalist Cici Xing finds it, oddly enough, on the shelves of a university bookstore. So what are, what are you seeing when you, when you look at the shelf here? Look at the logo, JPC. There's like a, a door. They are all Sermo, JPC, JPC, Zhonghua. JPC, they are all from Sino United. And who owns Sino United? It's a, not a simple question, but the big boss behind that it is the liaison office. The Beijing, the Chinese government? Yeah. You see, JPC, Sermo. She and her colleagues United, revealed that 30 publishing are, houses and more than half the bookstores in Hong Kong are now owned by the Chinese government, meaning it has real control over what is published, sold, and read, a grip that worries the protesters. In the publishing industry is far more important than like bank industry or other kind of industry because it affects who writes the history. Subtle but serious, and in a way, so are they. These protesters look so calm, it's easy to be lulled into thinking maybe they're losing steam. Then something imperceptibly changes and the crowd shifts. Getting up, moving towards the gates to the central government. Police confronted by a tiny, furious woman. There's aggression, but no clear idea of what to do with it. The crowd taunts. See what's happening over here? All the lasers being pointed at this officer uh, standing just behind the line of the headquarters of the central government. The police keep saying to the protesters, stop doing this, we're warning you. Stop shining the lights in our eyes and stop moving forward. So far, most of the protesters are listening. There's always a core group, though, who are mad enough to just keep moving forward. So now what? A huddle to make a plan. I listen to other people and follow their, 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 their step. Yeah. As fast as they advanced, some now leave. Police in pursuit. Hong Kong changing with every charging step. So I'll be back later in the show to look at another front in this battle. We're talking about the online world where once again things are not precisely as they seem. You'll see how the conflict in Hong Kong is having an impact in Canada. Right now, though, let's send it back to Toronto. And lots more ahead on The National. Ian is standing by in our Vancouver newsroom with stories developing tonight, plus dramatic new details about that boat fire off the coast of California. How were more than 30 people trapped under deck as the boat burned? We're back in two minutes. Welcome back. Let's get you to the National Newsroom in Vancouver, where Ian is tracking developing stories right across the country tonight. Ian. And Andrew, let's start with one of the big Ontario stories. Some university students won't be going back to class in the fall after a big cut to the province's student grant and loan program. Over $2,000 of what I would have been able to have in grants was completely gone. The previous Liberal government had created a kind of free tuition for students from families making less than $50,000 a year. The new PC government said it was unsustainable and cut the program by $600 million or 40% of its total funding. The RCMP says that it's found the truck that belongs to that former military reservist uh, who's also 
has alleged ties to a neo-Nazi group. It was found abandoned in southern Manitoba, but police say there is no sign of Patrick Matthews. Matthews was last seen over a week ago. Police say that his red pickup truck was found on a rural property not far from the U.S. border. They believe it's been parked there for roughly a week. The RCMP asking anyone who sees him to contact them immediately. We'll have more developing stories in about 20 minutes. Andrew? Officials have given up all hope of finding more survivors from a California dive boat devoured by flames. The bodies of 20 of the 34 victims have been recovered so far, but there are more down there. Paul Hunter now on what the search for answers is turning up. They went out again first thing this morning, out to the site of the fire in the waters off California, knowing what they'd soon have to tell the families of those on board who somehow might still be daring to hope. As of 9.40 a.m. this morning, Coast Guard has suspended search efforts pending further development. It is never an easy decision to suspend search efforts. Sadly, no additional survivors have been found. Bitty, bitty, bitty. The fire on a boat packed with scuba divers sleeping in their quarters overnight Saturday was horrifically fierce. Five crew members survived one crew and 33 passengers burned. Authorities today bluntly, clinically described the dead. There was a, a, an extraordinarily hot fire and the bodies do exhibit signs of, uh, of, of extreme thermal damage. Roger, are they locked inside the boat? But on the matter, were they actually locked inside? Today, clarity on that particular horror. Say authorities, there were no lockable doors but people were trapped, in a way, by something worse. There was a stairwell to get uh, down the main entryway, up and down, and there was an escape hatch, and it would appear as though both of those were blocked by fire. Today, divers continued to assess the boat, now on the seabed, 20 meters down, inside, still more bodies. Meanwhile, dockside, a memorial grows for the dead, among them, five members of a single family, as well as students and parents on a diving trip. As authorities elsewhere try to identify the bodies they've recovered, so too they work toward the key question on all of it. How did this happen? Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. And we will be right back. Next, Rosie goes in depth from the 905. As the federal parties vie for votes in battleground Ontario, what effect could controversial Premier Doug Ford have on the election? Rosie's up right after this. Welcome back to Mississauga, just west of Toronto, right in the heart of the area known as the 905, an area that has a history of picking the party that wins. In fact, it's virtually impossible to form government without taking these ridings, and that's why we're here tonight. The 905 is the belt of communities around Toronto named after its area code. It includes some of Canada's most populous cities, Mississauga, Brampton, Markham, Vaughan. There is a large swath of seats up for grabs here, 30 or so in all. In fact, there are more seats in the 905 than in most provinces. So electorally, these are the most important ridings in Canada. The millions of voters here tend to vote as a bloc, and that usually determines which party will form government. Friends, I'm delighted to be back in Mississauga with this our This is where the Conservatives won their majority in 2011, but many of those same voters abandoned Stephen Harper for Justin Trudeau in 2015, delivering a majority government for the Liberals. Right here in Mississauga and right across the country. So no surprise that leaders are going to spend a whole lot of time around here and a number of factors could shape the results this time around, not least of which is Ontario Premier Doug Ford and his progressive conservatives. They won the last uh, summer's provincial election here in this province thanks to the voters in the 905. But now the Ford factor looms large ahead of the federal election. 
Ben, can I have a sticker for Nathan since yeah, we're going around? Stella Ambler has been a conservative like MP before. Yeah, Did you? Grandpa, Yay! Getting ready for a campaign is nothing new to her. I'm actually supposed to be there more like 1, 1.15. Like She's in the office 12 hours a day, already surrounded by her team. So Everything okay for today? Yeah. She clearly relishes it. Okay, okay. We, we won't bump into you. Willie the dog basically lives here now, too. Okay, we're going out to do a little bit of door knocking. Okay, thank you. <laughs> we'll, we'll add to the number there, 29,382. She and every party know that winning these suburban ridings in and around Toronto is key to forming government. Okay, guys, have a good day. Last time, Ambler was up against the desire for change. This time, she may have to contend with another outside factor beyond her control. Just outside of Toronto, Mississauga Lakeshore has been conservative-friendly in the past. To clinch a majority, it's even clearer, most of the six seats in Mississauga must be won. Ontario is open for business! Most recently, this riding voted for Doug Ford's Conservatives in the last Ontario election. But that was before Ford made cuts to education, the arts and the environment in a bid to balance the budget. We have to find small efficiencies across the board. It's not sustainable. Those cuts may have cost federal Conservatives a chance at winning some seats. At one point this spring, Doug Ford's government was polling as low as the previous Liberal government under Kathleen Wynne in its dying days. Looking at Andrew Scheer's actions. That was quickly noticed and exploited by Justin Trudeau earlier this year, who suggested a vote for one Conservative was a vote for another. And Andrew Scheer? Well, Andrew Scheer takes his cues from the Ontario Premier, so Canadians can expect much of the same if he ever gets elected. Cuts to the Canada Child Benefit, cuts to the National Housing Strategy, cuts to the OAS and to CPP enhancements. And on climate change in particular, he's no better. It probably didn't help that last fall, Andrew Scheer was on the cover of a much talked about issue of McLean's, posing next to Conservative premiers with similar positions on issues like a carbon tax and government intervention, including Ford. At the annual summer gathering of the Mississauga Board of Trade, the talk is usually about how government choices impact business. But with an election in the offing, some of that conservative reluctance is on the table too. I think he's, he's stirred so many beehives. He's enacted too many things too quickly without a lot of public consultation. And I think it will work against the, uh, the federal conservative. All I can say is that, like a lot of Ontarians, I'm not exactly happy with the Ontario situation right now. Others say while Ford could be a problem, he is doing what he should. Premier Ford has issues that he believes are important to Ontario, and he is going to be very vocal about those with any federal government. It doesn't matter what party forms the government, uh, he will put Ontario's position forward for the betterment of, uh, of Ontarians. The Premier himself has said he will stay away from the federal election, telling reporters this summer he and Andrew Scheer get along well, but Ford says he has other concerns. I've talked to Andrew, and, and I'm, I'm the Premier of Ontario. i got to worry about Ontario. I'm not getting involved in this, uh, this election. It's unclear whether Ford came to this decision on his own or whether there was some conservative family pressure for him to stay out of things. Federal conservative sources now say they believe the worst of the negative impacts of Ford is over, unless or until he makes another move that will upset voters, something they ultimately can't control. Another issue worthy of discussion is... Uh... The Saga 960 radio station, as well as its Punjabi language station, broadcast to the country's sixth largest municipality, and they certainly have their finger on the pulse. Um, the Ford government's mandate now is to... Amik Singh is a full-time nurse, but on Saturdays he hosts an hour of political talk. He's voted for many different parties through the years. He's still open-minded, but he follows politics closely and has much to say. 
What about the Ford thing in this area? Because, yeah. um, you know, he's been pretty successful yeah. in the 905. Well, we, we've seen a lot of U-turns happen from, from the Ford administration, a lot of protests happening because of, uh, you know, you look at the autism file, the healthcare file, sure. the infrastructure file. Um, the promises made, promises kept it is a slogan that they'd like to chime once here and there, but what promises are they actually keeping? Um, and to whom actually they're, they're beholden to. So Ontarians were looking for a big change. Sure. But what came with the Ford administration was the same old, same old for the most part. And people aren't happy with it. And it wasn't yeah. foreign Singh is worried about health care and climate change and worried young people like himself just won't end up voting at all. Advance the same argument. At some point, there has to be a trade-off. His slightly older colleague, Darshan Maharaja, a chartered accountant who also does a daily show, says there may be some regret around Doug Ford, but people can make the distinction between him and Andrew Scheer. Among the sophisticated voters, they see a difference between how the two levels, even at the party uh, level, are different. Mm -hmm. The condition that Ontario was in in June last year was very different from where we are federally. Sure. So the sophisticated voter is not uh, hopefully going to buy the argument that Andrew Scheer will do what Doug Ford has done. Oh, hi, hi, good afternoon. Hi. I'm Stella Ambler. I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that is exactly what Stella Ambler says, that Scheer is a different kind of politician, and voters are smart enough to make that distinction. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Jackie. By. Take care. Yep, Bye-bye. you bet. Bye. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Stella Ambler. Hi. I know well, you. I know you. <laughs> I voted for you. Thank you. <laughs> and I will again. Yay! Yay. <laughs> what about that, that Doug Ford thing? I mean, I know you know the MPP here yes, in this yes. writing. Um, but now they've done things and they've sort of upset yeah. some people. Have you heard yeah. any of that stuff at the door? Not a lot, Not surprisingly. A lot. Uh, you know, I think people here do sort of get that this is, you know, that they're voting um, uh, against J Justin Trudeau or you know, or for Andrew Scheer, or however you want to say it. I think in their minds they're separating what needs to be done provincially okay. versus what's been done, like, the last four years of Justin Trudeau. Mm -hmm. He also got his neighbor... So, not everyone thinks of Doug Ford when they think of Andrew Scheer, and the Conservatives, like Stella Ambler, will work hard to prove that over the coming weeks. Thanks so much. Have a good afternoon. But the political damage may already have been done in some parts of Ontario. <laughs> The hope now that the Premier of Canada's biggest province keeps his promise and stays out of the campaign. Throughout this campaign, the National will try and help you make an informed decision once we get to that ballot box. So next week, we'll go in-depth on the challenges facing some Liberal candidates. I'll be in a key battleground riding in British Columbia that will help map the path to power. And next, Hong Kong's high stakes protests call for high tech solutions. Under strict surveillance from China, even in Canada, pro democracy protesters are finding ways to stay hidden in plain sight. Thomas Daigle explains next. This is Prince Edward Station in Hong Kong. That's the site of some pretty shocking violence over the weekend as police clashed with protesters inside the train station. Now, late last night, police raided it again with pepper spray and batons. It reportedly subdued two men, one of whom is said to have passed out. But Hong Kong's public spaces are really not the only battlefield, not by a long shot. The protest movement was largely born online, and months later, both sides are using some pretty innovative ways to spread their messages. That's even having an impact in Canada. Our senior technology reporter, Thomas Degla, shows us what they're up to. Here's some info on what's happening in Hong Kong. Yes, this looks about as low tech as it gets. Activists for Hong Kong in Toronto spreading their message the old fashioned way with flyers. But look closer, and even that paper hints at a bigger battle being waged away from the streets, entirely online. That's a QR code. When scanned, it unlocks text, pictures, and video, all meant to boost support for their movement. It's the final battle. If we lose this battle, that one country, two system analogy is gone. This small rally was organized online and promoted on Facebook. Hardly unusual, but apparently risky for them. 
Activists fear lending their name or face to the movement will land them under virtual surveillance by the Chinese state they're protesting against. So we have to be very careful on how we actually share our you know, phone numbers and names. We agreed to conceal the identity of this demonstrator. He fears for the safety of his family in Hong Kong. There were people actually taking pictures, taking headshots, big headshots. Um, and they possibly sent these pictures back to the Chinese embassy, uh, possibly sent it back to the Chinese government so that they actually keep a database of who actually show up in these protests. One trick they use to avoid snooping is by organizing on Telegram, the encrypted messaging app that allows users to hide their real names and numbers. By contrast, pro-Beijing activists tend to prefer WeChat, Chinese software with more than a billion active users. It's huge in mainland China and big with expats and immigrants here. Just ask avid WeChat user Victor Feng, born in China but living in BC for 15 years. People are afraid that the Chinese government might be watching everything, but I don't think my information is really worth the trouble for the government to invest, I don't know, billions or trillions of dollars in terms of uh, surveillance. Trouble is, WeChat is suspected of acting as a spy tool for Beijing, allowing the government to monitor users and spread disinformation without revealing the source. Just look at some of the chats I was shown with one person musing about wielding a gun and another user offering to bring an axe to threaten Hong Kong demonstrators. All ahead of this standoff between both sides in Vancouver. It ended peacefully but served as a reminder of the tension around Hong Kong, even here in Canada. Then why don't we sit down and stop the violence and figure out why you guys are still on the streets? Right, the other side, they're really, they're not telling the whole story. Indeed, both sides in the Hong Kong debate tell the story the way they want, sharing video to match their narrative. Like the way pro-Beijing media made this man sound like he was criticizing the protest movement. That's not protesting. That's just mob violence. Only for him to warn afterwards. And just to clarify that that video is heavily edited, doesn't represent my views. Hong Kong-born IT management professor Jim Tam has seen plenty by now. Just one example of the endless stream of user clips shared and reposted, often to support one side or the other. Which side has been using video more powerfully? I think both. Actually, um, when we look at the role of IT in this event, uh, we can see that it has been used very effectively and efficiently by the, uh, by the demonstrators for communication tool. While the debate rages online, yes, they are still out in the real world, campaigning for change half a world away. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. This wraps up our special coverage from Hong Kong. Andrew, back to you in Toronto. Okay, and Ian is back in two minutes with more developing stories. Plus, you might be surprised where your money is going. We'll look at the controversial companies the Canada Pension Plan invests in. Welcome back to our national newsroom in Vancouver. We're tracking developing stories tonight, including a new report from the United Nations about war crimes in Yemen. Shelling, airstrikes and snipers hit people going about their daily lives, often without warning in areas where there's no active combat going on. Among other human rights violations, the report found that all sides in the conflict are targeting civilians. It says Britain, France and the United States may be complicit due to their support of the Saudi-led coalition. We're also keeping a close watch on Afghanistan, where the Taliban has claimed responsibility for an attack that left 16 people dead and more than 100 others injured. This was a scene in eastern Kabul this morning, hours after a suicide bomber blew up a tractor filled with explosives outside a complex used mainly by foreigners. The United States is in the process of working out a deal with the Taliban that could see thousands of American troops leave Afghanistan within the next few months. And pop star Ariana Grande has filed a lawsuit against Forever 21 claiming the fashion retailer stole her name and likeness to promote its products. Her lawsuit says the retailer sought to trick customers into thinking Grande endorsed its brand, posting photos of her on its social media and using what the suit calls a look-alike model. 
The singer's asking for $10 million U.S. in damages. Next on The National, every Canadian pays into the Canada Pension Plan, but not every Canadian would agree with this. The fund invests in several gun companies. We explain next. It's been one month since a gunman stormed a Walmart in El Paso, Texas, killing 22 people. Well, in response today, Walmart announced more changes to its gun policies. It says it'll stop selling handgun ammunition and any ammunition that can be used in military-style weapons. It's also asking customers to stop openly carrying firearms into stores. Now, some investors are starting to take a stand on guns as well by taking their money out of companies that manufacture them. But, as Diane Buckner explains, if you're paying into the Canada Pension Plan, maybe you don't have that choice. We've come up with a portfolio for you uh, that is both socially responsible and fossil fuel free. Yeah. So I know Tina Lopez I is a conscientious TV. investor. I'm mostly interested in the geothermal. Person. She's told her advisor she's also uh, keen to avoid guns, especially since the shooting last year in her old neighborhood, Toronto's Danforth area. And I'm still in touch with neighbors there. The devastation to families, and I think most Canadians were really moved uh, by the grief that that caused. I, mean, I think that, that guns and military weapons are one of the biggest red flags when it comes to my clients. That really they don't want to be profiting from these uh, weapons. But the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, which manages the National Retirement Savings Fund that every Canadian worker pays into, holds stock in a number of companies that make assault rifles, handguns and ammunition. Uh, just type in CPPIB. Toby Heaps publishes a magazine about ethical investing. And then we go and see who the, who the big stocks are and then we go look at uh, how much of those stocks does the fund own and are they... He says a number of provincial pension funds for public servants have opted not to invest in companies that make bullets or assault rifles. In Canada, it's illegal to sell those guns, so it seems kind of weird that it's, it's legal for our national pension fund to invest in those funds. The stocks aren't great money makers either. This is where the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board has its head office. But the board declined our request for an interview. We thought maybe its spokesperson would point out that the plan owns just $37 million worth of weapons-related stock out of the $400 billion it manages. Again, I don't Although the dollar value makes no difference to Tina Lopez. I think it's wrong to look at it in terms of financial percentages. I want to look at it in terms of the impact on the most vulnerable people. So what we need to do is continue to push CPP towards adopting more stringent, socially responsible investment policies. Not every Canadian may be concerned about owning shares in weapons manufacturers, but those who don't want any part of what's been called an epidemic of gun violence are starting to speak up. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. And next on The National, in our moment, we will return to the Bahamas and meet people pitching in to help. The charity that's bringing tourists together to take care of the locals, right after this. Family Feud Canada is coming to CBC, and your family could win big. For a chance to be on the show, apply now at cbc.ca slash familyfeud. Relief efforts are ramping up to help those ravaged by Hurricane Dorian. And one NGO has been on the ground in the Bahamas for days making sandwiches. Now, it sounds like a small thing, but we're talking thousands of sandwiches out of several kitchens across the islands and getting that food directly into the hands of the people who need it most. And it doesn't stop there. The tourists who are stuck in those islands are coming together as well. And that is our moment. Well, some of these folks now probably might not have had a meal in two or three days, so it's imperative um, that we get over there as soon as possible, and that's what we're working on. And letting them know we're here to help, and in turn, they, they, they have really um, embraced us. And there's people who have been stuck here, but, you know, came for Labor Day weekend, wanted to leave because there was a hurricane, but they couldn't. So yesterday, we had maybe 20 to 30 folks 
a mix of locals and a mix of people from New York, from Florida, in our kitchen making sandwiches. And, you know, for me, seeing all of them doing that together, have it, sharing a moment, um, people from all different walks of life, you know, in our T-shirts, making ham and cheese sandwiches, sharing our projects, give people um, a way to get their mind off maybe some of the, of the bad things that come along with these storms. And hopefully offer some leadership and stability for these folks for, for a few hours or, or longer a day. Such a beautiful part of the world, Andrew, and under such devastation. And what an effort. I mean, we were reading that uh, they're using helicopters, for example, to move those sandwiches uh, to, to various islands to help out. Yeah, and, and it's, it's staggering to think of the level of coordination that's required to, to carry out that operation, right? They're working in conjunction with government, which is how they're able to do it. But, I mean, you mentioned helicopters. They're also apparently using jet skis as well. Anything that they can do, any vehicle they can use to get that food to the people who really need it. It's, uh, it's stand-up work, that's for sure. That's The National for this September 3rd. Have a good night. Good night.